1 Samuel 1. Now there was a certain man of Ramathaim, Zophim, of the hill country of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroam, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, no I'm kidding, Tohu, the son of Zaph, <laughs> an Ephraimite. He had two wives, and the name of one was Hannah and the other Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. This man went up out of his city from year to year to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. The two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, priests to the Lord, were there. When the day came that Elkanah sacrificed, he gave portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and her daughters. But he gave double portion to Hannah, for he loved Hannah. But the Lord had shut up her womb. Her rival provoked her severely to irritate her because the Lord had shut up her womb. So year by year, when she went up to the Lord's house, her rival provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why don't you eat? Why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? So Hannah rose up after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his seat by the doorpost of the Lord's temple. She was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. She vowed a vow and said, Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look at the affliction of your servant and remember me, and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a boy, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come on his head. <clears throat> As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli saw her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she was drunk. Eli said to her, How long will you be drunk? Get rid of your wine. <laughs> Hannah answered, No, my lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have not been drinking wine or strong drink, but I poured out my soul before the Lord. Don't consider your servant a wicked woman, for I have been speaking out of the abundance of my complaint and my provocation. Then Eli answered, Go in peace, and may the Lord of Israel grant your petition that you have asked of him. So she said, Let your servant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate, and her facial expression wasn't sad anymore. They rose up in the morning early and worshipped the Lord, then returned and came to their house in Ramah. Then Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. That's sex, by the way. Uh, <laughs> when the time had come, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she named him Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord, the man Elkanah and all his household went up to offer the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, Not until the child is weaned, then I will bring him, that he may appear before the Lord and stay there forever. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems good to you. Wait until you have weaned him. Only may the Lord establish his word. So the woman waited and nursed her son until she weaned him. When she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bulls and one ephah of a meal and a container of wine and brought him to the Lord's house in Shiloh. The child was young. They killed the bull and brought the child to Eli. She said, O oh my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood by you here praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child and the Lord has given me my petition which I asked of him. Therefore, I have also given him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is given to the Lord. He worshipped the Lord there. We're going to have our second Bible reading next. It's 1 Samuel chapter 2 from verse 1 to 11. That's 1 Samuel chapter 2 verses 1 to 11. This is Hannah's prayer. Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord my horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. 
There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one beside you. There is no rock like our God. Do not keep talking proudly or let my, your mouth speak much such arrogance. For the Lord is a God who knows, and by him deeds are weighed. The bows of the warriors are broken, but those who stumble are armed with strength. Those who, f who were full hire themselves out for food, but those who were hungry are hungry no more. She who was barren has borne seven children, but she who has many sons pines away. The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down the grave and raises up. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes and has them inherit a throne of honour. For the foundations of the earth are the Lord's. On them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful servants, but the wicked will be silenced in the place of darkness. It is not by strength that one prevails. Those who oppose the Lord will be broken. The Most High will thunder from heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his kings and exalt the horn of his anointed. Then Elkanah went home to Ramah, but the boy ministered before the Lord under Eli the priest. Well, Harry was a man that worried a lot. Harry worried about his work. He worried about his family. He worried about his mortgage. He worried about his health. And the more that he worried about these things, the less healthy he became. His friends noticed Harry's worry in his body language, in his demeanour, in how he carried himself. He was just sad and depressed, it seemed. But one day Harry met George, his friend, for a cup of coffee. And George noticed a difference in Harry. He seemed content. He even seemed to be fairly happy. It was very obvious. So he said, to, he said to Harry, he said, it's great to see you, Harry, and you seem to be doing a lot better. What, what's brought about the change? He said, well, I don't worry about anything anymore. It's fantastic. He says, well, how did that change occur? What, what happened, Harry? What, what have you learned? What have you discovered? What? Harry says, well, it's really good. I found this person, and he does all my worrying for me now. Who's heard it? <laughs> you may have. <laughs> and every time that I worry about anything, I just pick up the phone, and I tell him what it is, and he takes care of it. Fantastic. George said, that's amazing. I've never heard of anything like that. That's new to me. He said, well, I found this guy and it's working for me and it's fantastic. It's certainly worth it. George says, well, what do you mean it's worth it? He says, well, it's, it's good, but it does cost me $1,000 a week. George says, $1,000 a week? How on earth can you afford to pay this guy $1,000 a week to do your worrying for him? He said, well, that's his worry, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> if only. It was like that, eh? But the reality is, it seems the greater the pain, the harder it is to let that thing go, causing the pain. Yet Harry, I think, who was able to hand over his worry, might be onto something. So let's have our Bibles open and uh, got any questions on that text? It's helpful as we begin uh, 1 Samuel. In fact, Samuel was one book originally written, but then they uh, divided it up into two. See where that fits in the biblical timeline. 
So we see there, beginning with creation, and then we looked last week at what went wrong, the fall, got the flood, Tower of Babel, then Abraham. Uh, Abraham, man was promised to have land, to have descendants, to form a nation, to be a blessing to all the world. And uh, then uh, a couple of generations later, I've got the slavery. Moses brings them at slavery in Egypt for 400 years. In fact, I might just go on to that next slide. There's a little bit more detail. Um, they're in, in Egypt for 400 years. They get out. They're wandering around the desert for 40 years. And then Joshua leads them into the promised land. And then there's that other period we see in the blue there for about another 400 years, the era of the judges, it's called. Various judges were raised up, Gideon, Samson, guys like that, but they failed pretty much to bring order and bring much change about in this in, in Israel. And at that time, Israel was not a nation as such. It was just a pretty rough confederation of 12 tribes. And yet they were supposed to be under God's rule. But tragically, during this time, the people turned away from the Lord that had brought them out of Egypt, and they turned to the gods of the nations around them, the nations that they hadn't subdued, as they were told to. It was a pretty horrible time. It was a time of violence amongst the people. It was a time of wars with the surrounding nations. And it was general chaos and anarchy reigning at the time. The last verse in the book of Judges, I know we've got Ruth there in our Bibles, but chronologically, probably go Judges and Samuel. The last verse in the book of Judges says, In those days Israel had no king, and everyone did as they saw fit. Sounds like today, doesn't it? <laughs> but that verse sets up the book of 1 Samuel. Because 1 Samuel is all about the transition from this group of tribes into a monarchy. It's not going to be an easy transition. The book of Samuel highlights Samuel and Israel's first king, kings, Saul and David, who they were, how they came to the throne, and how they fared on the throne. But more than that, it's a book about the great king, the Lord God, who was there all along and, and working through his prophet Samuel. But we begin in 1 Samuel 1 with the arrival of Samuel. In this period of selfish chaos, there's a sharp contrast with Samuel's devout parents. In a sense, this first chapter is setting Samuel up to, to display his credentials, as it were, from this godly family. In verse 1, we see Elkanah, Samuel's father, can trace his lineage back to Ephraim, who was one of Joseph's sons born in Egypt. Elkanah, we see, has two wives, Hananiah and Hannah. And it seems Hannah would have been the first wife, but as she was not able to bear children, uh, Elkanah, uh, and continue that prestigious line um, of Elkanah's. So he marries... Penaniah as afterwards. Now the Bible is very clear about one husband and one wife, starting back in Genesis. That is God's ideal. They are to leave their families, to cleave to each other, and form a new family unit. And whenever we see Bigamy or polygamy in the Bible, it is always problematic. And again, it is the case here, although it appears to be more or less culturally acceptable. But there are problems. We see in verse 6 there, Penanah has a rival who provokes and irritates 
and taunts Hannah because she's unable to conceive. It's very tough for a couple today who are not able to conceive. And there's all sorts of things that they can do to try and do that today, but it can be very tough as a couple goes through that process. And yet the shame and the embarrassment and the sense of failure that Hannah would have experienced in that particular culture at that time would be huge. And yet Hannah stands in a line of women in the Bible that are unable to conceive, at least initially. The Bible has these long narratives of the conception and birth of children that are significant figures in the Bible, in the history of Israel. And so Abraham and Sarah had the promise of countless descendants, of forming a nation. But Sarah did not conceive for another 25 years, not until she was 90 years of age did she give birth to Isaac. Isaac's wife, Rebecca, could not have children for the first 20 years of their marriage. And then finally she gave birth to Jacob and Esau. Jacob married Rachel, who is described as barren, until the Lord remembered her. Similar with Samson's mother in Judges. And likewise we see Hannah's womb is closed by the Lord, verse 5. So it would be a miracle by God to open her womb for her to conceive and give birth. And Peninnah's taunting, verse 7, went on year after year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord in Shiloh, her rival provoked her until she wept and would not eat, or could not eat. And then we see in verse 8, Elkanah makes, well, it seems to me, a pretty average attempt to empathise with uh, Hannah's emotional pain and the abuse that she's copying from Peninnah. Then one year at Shiloh, Hannah may have just had enough. She stands up. As her family was eating the meal, probably from the sacrifice. And she walks away from them. And she goes to the Lord's house. And there Eli, the high priest, is sitting. In deep anguish, we read, Hannah wept bitterly and prayed to the Lord. In verse 11, she makes this vow. Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life. And no razor will ever be used on his head. In despair, she turns to the Lord Almighty, to Yahweh Sebaoth, if I've got that right, for help. It's interesting, that particular Hebrew title is used here for the first time in verse 3 of 1 Samuel. And Hannah uses that same title in her prayer. It means the Lord of hosts. It refers to the Lord of heaven's army, showing that he is Lord over all the earth, but also Lord over all the celestial powers. There's many names for God. This, this is a really, really big name for God, as it were, that she uses here. 
this all-powerful Lord of heaven and earth, God Almighty, is the one that she turns to for a miracle child. And she vows to return such a precious gift of a child if she be granted that, back to God forever. He answers her cry. And then on behalf of this potential child, she makes what's called a Nazarite vow, where a person would abstain from food, oh, sorry, from alcohol, from cutting of their hair, and they would avoid any contact with a dead body. Now, usually that was done for a set period of time. In fact, Samson was one that did that. But this was to be a permanent feature for this God-given baby for the rest of their life. Hannah is pouring her heart out to the Lord, yet Eli the priest mistakes her unrestrained emotion and anguish for drunkenness. The last thing this poor woman needs now is a dig from the high priest to say, well, you're drunk. (laughs) And yet, that's what she gets. Eli's wrong observation is really... Uh, and his comments there uh, is really a metaphor for his failure in his spiritual leadership of Israel. And the words that he uses there we see are going to be used to describe his sons in chapter 2. So Hannah explains to him in verses 15 and 16, and she says, Not so, my Lord. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Realising that she's speaking the truth, Eli then changes tack and gives her his blessing. Go in peace, and may the God of Israel Grant what you have asked him. Anna's reply is rather prophetic. (laughs) May your servant find favour in your eyes. And as Hannah turns to walk away, what do we see? Her face is no longer downcast, her saving. Though she was deeply upset about being childless, she came to this Lord Almighty over heaven and earth who was much greater than her pain. Though she was distressed, she came to someone who was bigger than her distress. And as she praised him and prayed, she brought her painful petition to him and she gave it to him. She handed it over. We can learn a lot from Hannah here. So often the pain and the worry of our circumstances tends to overwhelm us. It makes it very difficult for us to focus on other tasks. We can lose sleep. We have conversations, hypothetical conversations <laughs> racing through our head or perhaps the conversation that occurred and we imagine what they might be thinking. What will the consequence be? How can I do something to change this? And on top of all that that we tend to experience, Hannah had this embarrassment of being childless and on top of that being provoked by Penina all the time. Yet in the midst of all this, Hannah paused. She stopped. She stood up. And she went to the Lord, to his house. She recognised him as the Lord Almighty who knew her circumstances, 
who knew the taunts, who knew her anguish and embarrassment. And as big and painful as all these things were, she knew he was bigger, that he was sovereign, even in the midst of that. Hannah didn't know the outcome. Prayed for a child, but she didn't know what was going to happen. But she gave her burden over and trusted God in the circumstance. And that handing over transformed Hannah. On the inside, she received the blessing of peace from the Lord that Eli gave her in his blessing. And this affected her outside demeanour as well. From being downcast, the Lord lifted Anna up. Now, in just the next two verses, we see the Lord remembered her, she falls pregnant, she gives birth and names the boy Samuel. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> and now the following year when their family heads off for their annual sacrifice, Anna doesn't go. Baby Samuel would barely be two months old, if that. Even after pregnancy and the powerful bonding that occurs between mother and baby. Anna also remembers. She remembers the Lord and she remembers her vow and says to Elkanah in verse 22, After the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord and he will live there always. After the boy is weaned, verse 24, at around three or four years of age, Elkanah, Hannah and Samuel head off to the house of the Lord once again at Shiloh. They present a rather extravagant sacrifice of a bull, or it could be three bulls, uh, and flour and wine. And in this very powerful scene of devotion, Hannah honours her vow and returns to God what he has graciously given her. Having come to God with nothing, she now returns to give back, to hand over her precious son. In verse 26, Hannah wants Eli to know that she is the woman who stood there a few years ago and prayed and the one that he, Eli, ended up blessing. In fact, Hannah's words to Eli in verse 27 echo his words to her in verse 17. I prayed for this child, she says, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord for his whole life. He'll be given over to the Lord. Imagine that, that scene would be so powerful, wouldn't it? You know, here's my only dear child, Eli. Take him, train him, look after him, won't you? <laughs> and I'll come back just once a year to see him. And he worshipped the Lord. That he, I thought, who is, which he is it? It would probably be Eli, but I wondered what little Samuel was doing too. For those of us who have the joy of having children as Christian parents, we should acknowledge our children as a gift of the Lord too. And in a sense, whether it's a formal thing at a dedication service, which I've got to say, that's where Neville is. Where's Eddie? Uh, he hasn't got a saw back. Today, his little granddaughter is getting dedicated, so that's where he is. So, 
That's great. Um, so we can do that at a, at a formal dedication service or not. In, in a sense, we're giving our children back to the Lord, as it were. You see, he loves them more than we ever could. He is the perfect father. And we are very imperfect parents, are we not? Though we point to him, he is the only one that can draw our children to him so that they give their lives to him. And then in chapter 2, we have Hannah's beautiful prayer. Her heart rejoices because she recognises it's the Lord that the one that has strengthened her and lifted her horn there on high, verse 1. Whenever you see that word horn, just think of strength, of victory or exalted status. She acknowledges God answered her prayer and there she's delighting in his deliverance. You see there. She can boast over Peninnah because hers was a miracle child. And she will go on to have more children, we'll see in chapter 2. In verses 3 to 10, Hannah speaks here of a series of reversals. These reversals display God's character and I think the upside-down nature of his kingdom. Even as the proud and arrogant speak there, we see the Lord is weighing their deeds, verse 3. The world sees strong warriors, it sees the well-fed, it sees the one with many sons, it sees the wealthy. But we see God breaks them down, makes them hungry, they pine away or become poor. And also we see that God feeds the hungry, blesses the barren with children, raises the poor from the dust and guards the feet of his faithful servants. Because, verse 9, it is not by one's own strength that one prevails. You see, the Lord is the judge and it is him who gives strength to his king and exalt, exalts the horn of his anointed. It's quite an interesting last line there. How Hannah's prayer of praise mentions his king. This is the first time in scripture of God's designated, his king. He said to, to Abraham and Sarah, kings will come from you. But here, it's in fact the whole thing here, we're talking about the Hebrew there, Michelle. It's really complex, the Hebrew and all of this. So much we don't pick up actually. Um, but anyway, um, this his king. Very clear. He's anointed. This is the first time this appears in the Bible. And a king is the very thing that Samuel is going to oversee the transition of. Hannah's prayer reflects these reversals of transformation that she experienced as well. She received a transformation, a change, a reversal from childless shame to the joy of a God-given child in answer to her heartfelt prayer. The supreme example of this reversal is the gospel itself, is it not? Where God delights to forgive and embrace sinful people who repent and trust in his Son by faith. Not on those who rely on their strength their intellect, their speed, their power, their money, whatever, that means nothing to the Lord. The gospel is the ultimate level playing field. No one brings a thing to God apart from sin <laughs> and the need to be cleansed. The birth of Samuel occurs in the midst of this gross national sin, chaos and anarchy. Israel is barren, just like Hannah is. Each has a desperate need that any God can satisfy. 
The book opens with God's intervening on behalf of both Hannah but also of Israel. He delivers Hannah from her barrenness and he's about to intervene in the history of Israel. The deliverance is the same for Hannah and Israel. That is the birth of a weak and innocent child. The birth of Samuel signals the end of Hannah's painful sterility and Israel's anarchy. And God still looks for faithful people like Hannah that he can use, faithful, humble, godly people that he can do amazing things through. 